So now let's go back a little bit to fluorescence. We had those stars and we said, okay, we take the star and we put it in the light and then it really, really glows once we actually see it in the dark. And so what's actually going on with each of these things? Well, the electrons, as we've already kind of talked a little bit about these subatomic particles, is really where the energy actually is in an atom. And so it's important for us to kind of talk a little bit about electrons. We're going to be talking a lot about them throughout the semester. And so we kind of mentioned that there's also all of these energy shells where, where electrons can actually reside. And so in essence, the further away from the nucleus they are, the greater amount of energy they actually have. And you can kind of think of them as a loaded spring, so that if you have an electron that's um, at one point and you kind of pull that spring out, that it actually is kind of containing all this energy, so when you let go, it's just going to spring back. Okay. And so that's actually exactly what happened when we actually took those stars and we put them into the light. We're actually taking energy from the sun or from the light source, whatever that is, and we're donating that energy so that it can take the electron to that outer state. And then like the picture that we have shown here, if we can take this thing and put it in the dark, you can then see that what's going to happen is that electron's going to kind of spring back to what is actually called its ground state, kind of the normal electron shell that it actually would reside in. And once it goes back to the ground state, it's actually going to release some of that energy. Okay, and in the, in the case of these stars, is fluorescence or light. And those, those photons are just essentially these kind of tiny particles of light. They have no mass, but they actually contain some amount of energy. And so that's kind of a, a way of understanding how fluorescence actually works. And we're going to be kind of using these same ideas when we talk about how we can extract energy from food is in essence our food has these electrons in these kind of excited states um, which gives us a lot of energy. And so let's talk a little bit about another demonstration on how we can understand um, how uh, the atomic structure can help us understand the world around us. So we can have this glass of water and we can say, well, if we put things in the water, what things mix and what things don't mix? So we could take alcohol and put it in, we could take oil, we could take salt, or we even could take some flour and see if any of these individual things mix around and have this understanding of, of what happens um, at the atomic level. And so we could actually do this with an experiment. And so we could start out with four different jars that are containing water, and that's it. They have nothing else but water. And we could go ahead and add each of these four different things that I already mentioned that we could actually go ahead and do into each of those four individual jars. We could then take them, mix them around thoroughly, and then go ahead and just set them back on the table and let them sit for about a minute and see what happens. Well, hopefully this is what you would guess would actually happen. As you can clearly see, we can have the oil over here, the alcohol was in the water here, the flour is here, and the salt is over here. And so what we can clearly see is what mixes? Well, the rubbing alcohol and the salt actually mixes in with the water. But the oil and the flour don't really seem to mix that well. And if you looked carefully at the flour, you'd actually even see it kind of starting to precipitate out in the bottom. And clearly the oil forms this nice layer with the water. And many of you, I'm sure, have already seen that in your own lives as well. And so the real question is, is we can kind of focus in on these first two treatments, the alcohol and the oil, and say, why was it that alcohol was able to mix in, but the oil really didn't? And so a lot of folks have pr kind of predicted that maybe there's this density issue. They see that oil floats on top, and so maybe density was really the, the thing that prevented it from being able to mix in with water, whereas maybe alcohol was really not, not really that case. And so we could actually test this hypothesis and say, okay, well, what's actually going to happen? And so we could take our oil and our water and we could try and mix them together and let them settle and realize that they're not going to mix together. And we could actually take some of that alcohol and mix the alcohol in with this oil and water concoction. If you do it carefully, you would actually get something that looked a little bit like this. You can see that the alcohol is just sitting on the top of the oil. And so that kind of tells us, well, that maybe that's that's maybe that's that is the case. Maybe it's not the case because it, it is floating, so maybe it's it's even less dense. Um, but the oil is is that does that mean that oil is moderate density and the water is is is, is the most dense? Well, what happens if you go ahead and, and shake this up? Then you can actually have an understanding of what really is going to happen. And what do we find? Well, we find that the alcohol in the water, just like we saw before, does indeed mix. And they're also all at the bottom and oil is at the top. 
And so that really kind of is not supporting our, our, our thinking that, that water is, is, is kind of separating things by density because alcohol is actually less dense than both water or oil, but it's actually mixing just fine with the water and oil still is not. And so as we kind of think a little bit about um, what's actually going on, we got to really think back to the atomic structure and think about those electrons once again. And so here is um, an example of carbon, okay? And so we have this, this particular atom, and we can say, well, what's actually gonna happen with this thing? Well, with carbon, we have these things, um, these electrons, and they're in this outer shell. And specifically, it doesn't matter if the, the outer shell is the first shell or the second shell or the third or the fourth. We just call this outer shell by a specific name, and that's the valence shell. And it has a specific name because it's really, really important because that's what actually interacts with other things. And so the valence shell we can see here is the outside. Of course, it's also always indicated with that um, Lewis structure that you've already um, seen before. And we know then from our octet rule is that if we had that inner shell, kind of the maximum number of electrons it can take is two, and then all the subsequent shells, um, give or take, really need to hold on to four. And so with carbon, we can clearly see that it already has four in its valence shell, which essentially means that it just needs four more. And so we gotta ask ourselves, well, where are those four actually gonna come from? And let's get back to that in a second, but first let's go ahead and, and do this same kind of exercise with another um, particular atom, not carbon, but let's focus in on oxygen. And we can kind of identify some of those same different parts. And so oxygen, we can clearly see, has um, <clears throat> four protons. We can clearly see that by just looking at the periodic table. Um, and of course, we could count them in this, this image as well. And based on that, we say, well, to oppose those, we actually are gonna have um, eight electrons, and indeed we have two on the inside, and we actually have six on the outside. And then of course, um, if we have an almost uh, 16 as our um, atomic weight, then we clearly know that we probably have about, um, on average, about eight uh, of those uh, neutrons. And of course, there's probably some that are lighter um, because of those isotopes, and which isn't why it's not exactly 16. But we can kind of see in general that that's the case, is we have eight protons, eight electrons, and eight neutrons in oxygen. And if we're kind of thinking about those valence shells, and we say, well, the whole goal is to kind of get these full shells, we can clearly see that we're simply missing two more to get to our eight. And so the real question is, where do we get those two? And in many cases, the best way to do it is to simply share with other atoms. And so we think about, well, where could we get those two? Where, what other things could we share it with? Well, an easy way to do this is to look to hydrogen because hydrogen really only has one electron and one proton. It actually doesn't have any neutrons at all. And so we can see that if we actually have two of those things, they each have one electron. And of course, they're aiming to only get two because that's all they have is that, that innermost shell that only can max out at two electrons. And so if hydrogen and oxygen can just share those two right there, then they can actually both complete their outer electron shell. Okay, which is kind of the goal with um, sharing these things and forming bonds. And so they go ahead and do that, and that is, of course, our water molecules. You can actually see the oxygen here. It has a full inner shell with two, and then the outer shell, by just simply sharing these, can actually have two. And of course, these ones are also happy because they have now a full inner shell at two and a full inner shell of two of having our oxygen and our two hydrogens. And so that's really all kind of works out very nicely. And the bond, or the kind of sharing of those two electrons, is what's called a covalent bond. And that kind of makes sense. Co means together or to share, and valent refers to the valence. They're sharing those valence electrons. And so that's kind of where everyone gets happy. <clears throat> And so we can kind of think in terms of the fact that, that the goal is to really kind of have all of these things shared, and that's a really kind of good thing is to have that, the kind of goal is to have this shared valence electrons. And so you can kind of think of that full valence shell as kind of reaching the finish line. And clearly, all um, atoms really want to do that, but there's some atoms that are kind of at the front of the line and they're kind of 
um, closer to being able to reach that, that full shell. And some of them are a little bit further away. And you can clearly know that if you're really close to the finish line, you're going to really run a whole lot faster to try and get there. Whereas if you're further back and you see a whole bunch of other kids in front of you, you're probably not going to go as far. And that's exactly the same with what that happens with atoms. If we actually go back to our periodic table, you can kind of think about wh who are going to be those kids that are close to the finish line. Well, it's going to be all of the atoms that are only one away from having a full valence shell. And so those are going to be the particular types of atoms that are going to be really, really wanting to get to that finish line. They are kind of, they have the most drive to get a full valence shell. And so they're going to fight for it. Or all the other ones that are a little further away, carbon or phosphorus, any of those, they're not as, as close. They're, they're closer, but they're, they're not as close, so they're not going to fight for it as, as far. Um, and so that kind of measure of how close they are, if you will, to having that full um, valent shell is this measure called electronegativity, which is the tendency of an atom to attract electrons. And so we can kind of understand that things like that chlorine is very, very close, and so it's going to have a high electronegativity. So we can picture this periodic table kind of coded by electronegativity. And so in essence, the larger the dot, the greater the electronegativity. So the greater they're going to attract those particular um, electrons to try and fill their valence shell. And so you can see there's these trends that as you kind of move um, across the um, periodic table, it gets to be greater electronegativity. And as you go up in the periodic table, it tends to be um, greater in electronegativity. And so this kind of shows um, uh, per different types of, of atoms or elements in their, their willingness or their um, drive to, to gain more electrons. And so if we go back to that water molecule and say, well, here's the oxygen, here's the two hydrogens, what is their difference in electronegativity? Well, we can see the hydrogen is this dot right here, and here's the oxygen right here, this really, really big dot right there. And so clearly we can see that oxygen has greater electronegativity, so it's going to, if you will, fight for those electrons a whole lot more. And this is kind of, in essence, what actually ends up happening, is that oxygen is fighting more, and so it's actually pulling on the electrons more. And so it has what's called a partial negative charge. This little delta symbol is referring to a partial charge. So it's not fully negative, because it doesn't have this negative charge, but it's just pulling enough on those electrons, which we know are negatively charged, so that it is a partial negative charge. And clearly, the hydrogens aren't pulling quite as hard. And so since they have less pull from those hydrogens, they're slightly positive. And so the water molecule has these kind of different ends, a slight positive and a slight negative end. And so when we kind of have that difference in the pulling of electrons when they're not pulling about the same, that covalent bond has a special name, and it's called polar. And polar is this uneven sharing. If they shared perfectly, okay, so if you have some molecule like oxygen, O2, you have two atoms that are actually pulling the same on those shared electrons. And so that would be nonpolar. But in this case with water, they are actually pulling very unevenly, which is called polar. And so if we go back to that example of putting all those different things in water, we can kind of use this idea of polarity to kind of understand what's actually going on. And we've already looked at these terms, hydrophilic and hydrophobic, but this kind of helps us understand what's actually going on at kind of the atomic level. And so hydrophobic thing, or hydrophilic rather, things are water loving. And it's because of the fact that there are things that are, have also these partial, or in some cases, full charges, which then allow them to attract to water, which is also a polar uh, molecule because of these slight positive, slight negative ends. Um, in opposition, we have things that are hydrophobic or watering fearing because they have no charge. These are things like fats we've already talked about, that they don't have any partial ends to the molecules whatsoever. And so we can kind of take a look at all of those things that we put into water and say, which one do we believe are hydrophilic? <clears throat> And we can take a look. Is it alcohol, oil, salt, flour? Or maybe it's, it's more than one of the above. Well, we can see that clearly that alcohol and salt are going to be hydrophilic. So it would have been E would have been a good answer. And we can say, well, does that relate to this idea of polarity? Well, yes, because alcohol is a polar molecule. And oil is nonpolar, which is the whole reason it's hydrophobic. Okay, um, But then we can think about oat flour and say, well, that's also nonpolar. And so that makes sense that that was hydrophobic. But what about salt? Salt comes up with an, another interesting question. So let's talk a little bit about salt. 